if you cannot get rewarded for better quality, then you do have to compete on price. But as we've said earlier in the, in the session, if you're going to reduce your price, you want to make certain that you can still be profitable. And that means you must first reduce your cost. So how do we do it? Well, one way that is commonly done is what we call the big box formula. And, and the big box formula basically works off a simple concept. And the concept is scale. It's all about scale. It's all about volume. In this sense, might makes right. And what makes right is when we can find a cost and fix it. Fix it so that regardless of how many units we affect, the cost does not change. So for example, if, if Nova Farm calls me up and says, Ken, we want you to come down and, and put on a program, and how much would it be? And I say, well, that's great. I'd love to do it. For you, a special deal, it's $100. And Nova Farm would sit there and they'd say, well, geez, you know, if, if only one person comes to hear Ken talk, the unit cost of having Ken make that presentation is $100 a head. And so in a sense, if we were going to charge admission, we would have to charge a price greater than $100 in order to stay in business. But if two people come, if two people come, Ken still charges $100. Now the unit cost falls to $50 a head. And as a consequence of that, I can charge a price under $100, under $100, and make money. And it gets even better, because if four people come, it's $25 a head. If eight people come, it's $12.50 a head. Nova Farm's no fool. That's why the room has all these people in it, because they understand. Look at the downward trend. You know, we get enough people in the room Ken will have to pay us to show up. Or so they would hope. So they would hope. And this is the mistake a lot of people make, is they have this presumption that the cost just keeps falling forever and ever. And so, geez, you know, if we can just get enough people, we can afford to stay in business even at these incredibly low prices. It doesn't work that way. Diminishing returns sooner or later kicks in. Sooner or later, this cost curve just flattens out, and more volume is not going to help you make money. If you're losing 4 to $5 on every script because of the differential between all, all in costs and what you're receiving as a dispensing fee, more volume means you're losing even more money. What a great formula for success that is. Now, the reason these scale economies are so important is that in North America, in fact, in most economies, the way in which we set prices is called cost plus pricing. So we add up all of our costs, and then we add to that what we consider a reasonable profit margin. And the sum of the two, our cost plus our profits, becomes our price. So if you're looking at this cost curve, what you end up seeing is a price curve that runs parallel to it. And if you understand that, then you understand why market share is the holy grail of so many firms. Because the concept is simple. Whoever has the biggest market share has the biggest volume. Whoever has the biggest volume has the lowest cost. Whoever has the lowest cost can charge the lowest price, and at that low price they will make money while all of the smaller competitors lose money. And so you have the most fundamental rule of competitive strategy. If you're going to compete against somebody bigger than you, you better not be selling the same thing they do. Because if you're selling the same thing they do, nobody ever paid more for something they could get elsewhere for less, logically, they're going to buy it from whoever's got the lowest cost, the lowest price. You can win the sale, but only if you accept the loss. Big box stores realize this. And so what the big box stores say is, if I can get in the situation, if I can manipulate the situation so that my costs are scale sensitive, then what I can do is make the argument, the more scale I have, the lower my costs become. I can then take those lower costs and I can pass them on to the customer in the form of lower price. But we said earlier, that's not always the best thing to do, because it only takes two seconds to match a price cut. It's not as efficient. And so 
And here's where Walmart and the modern big box store comes in. Because what they said was, we're not just going to give it to you in lower price. That's what we used to do with Miracle Mart. That's what we used to do with the discount stores that are now all bankrupt. So here's what we'll do. We'll give it to you in the form of better quality. Or better yet, what I'll do is I'll give some of it to you in the form of lower price. And I'll give some of that cost advantage to you in the form of better quality. And when they start to do this, they become a devastating competitor because the combination of lower price and better quality means the customer is now getting a product that has intrinsically, fundamentally superior value. And as long as their marketing and sales departments do a good job of communicating that value to the customer, the result is more sales. More sales means more scale, and more scale means even lower costs. And now you have a self-perpetuating strategy for success. Sometimes called the productivity cycle, sometimes called the virtuous cycle, but the notion here is simple. If scale generates lower costs, then rather than take those lower costs and simply be more profitable for one period, we'll take those lower costs, we'll reinvest them into giving the customer lower prices and or better quality so that our product now has superior value, which means more sales, more scale, lower costs, better value, more sales, more scale, lower costs, better value. And you understand now how Walmart can legitimately make the claim to consistently rolling back prices. You understand how the game gets played. Right? The one thing you have to be alert to, however, is there are limits to that growth. There's only so far that you can go if you're Walmart standardizing things in order to achieve these scale economies. People are not scalable, are they? Systems are scalable, machines are scalable, parking lots are scalable, but not people. And so the typical response to a big box competitor is, don't compete on the scalable factors. Compete instead on the things that are scale resistant. People are not scale, res are, are scale resistant. There's only so many hours, so many days that we can work, and then we break down. There's only such a period of time over which we can maintain consistent levels of quality. The Walmart, the big box model, is based upon their ability to systematize everything. You didn't see checkout, self-checkout counters appear in small footprint grocery stores. You saw them first in big grocery stores. You didn't see the, the use of, of kiosks to provide information in smaller stores. You saw it first in Walmart. In fact, there are Walmart operations, as I understand it, in the southern US, where you can go online, input your shopping list, and they will tell you step by step. Uh, they will take you through the local Walmart store on a little tour. Take three steps forward, there's your celery. Take another two, there's the cabbage you're looking for, and so on. You can do that if you're Walmart, because you can spread that cost over thousands of customers. You can't do that if you're a corner store. But if you're a corner store, now, now your destiny may lie in having a person instead of a kiosk providing those directions. And this is where the community pharmacy becomes a much bigger player against the big box pharmacy.